making it a great and happy occasion, Lord God, just to be in your presence tonight, Lord. Just have your way in this place tonight. Be glorified amongst us, Lord God. Open our eyes, open our ears, that we might know you all the more. Of every battle, of every heartbreak, through every circumstance, oh, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. Oh, I place tonight, Lord God, for all those, Lord, that are under the weather, not feeling well, have circumstances beyond their control that they can't seem to get resolution for, Lord, we, we run to you tonight. You are the Lord omnipotent. There is nothing that's outside of your ability to do, Lord. 
to you. You are our hiding place tonight. We thank you for that goodness that we found, the goodness that you provide. Have your way in this place tonight.
Jesus, for your goodness. Again, Lord God, we just ask you that you be with us tonight as we sit under the authority of your word. Speak to our hearts. Reveal your truth in your life. We love you in this place tonight. Have your way we pray in Jesus' name. You think I did it right, Christine? <laughs> For those of you that don't know, Christine has a little history with me. Uh, she started coming to our church uh, how many years ago? A long time ago. And uh, kind of, you know, now that I think about it, it kind of goes along with what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, and you'll catch on why I'm saying this at the end, but I'll tell you kind of how I met Christine. My daughter went to Fowlerville High School, and uh, we had a church there in Fowlerville that we planted, and uh, it was a little, maybe a little bit different than uh, a lot of churches. Not better, not worse, just a little different in that uh, most of our people that came there weren't churchgoers, and a good share of them didn't have any I get teary. I didn't even think about this on it just because it's my heart. Didn't have a whole lot of background with church. And some of them were uh, maybe a little bit on the outside of, uh, you know, quote unquote, a successful society. I don't know how else to say it. Great people, great talents and gifts and Incredible stuff, but because they thought maybe a little outside of the normative church uh, line of thinking, apparently they felt comfortable coming to my church. <laughs> but anyway, so my daughter Sarah, who was older than Adrian, Adrian was a friend of Christine's uh, daughter, Brittany. And Adrian had been asking her to come to church, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it was my daughter's 18th birthday, 21st birthday. And uh, she said that, you know, Dad, I'm going to turn 21, and I want to have a drinking party. And I said, oh, okay, what, uh, what did you want to do with that? And she said, well, I want to take all the money that people would have used to go to a drinking party, and I want to put it to uh, money to raise money for wells in in places that don't have safe drinking water. What's that? I said, quote, drinking. Right. And so I said, dude, I'm I'm in. And so we put up a big tent and invited everybody with those words, come to our drinking party. And uh, so there was a lot of people that came. And uh, that night, and not because they're drinkers, by the way. <laughs> but that night, I can remember, gosh, I can remember you guys walking across the street from their house, from their apartment, coming over there, and you go, hey, we're friends of Adriana's, and, you know, just, she invited us to come. So they came to our church, and at that point, uh, they had some struggles, they can tell you their own. Uh, they had some real struggles, some real life challenges, and, uh, but they decided they are going to continue to come to church, and uh, in the process, Christine was, you know, kind of drawn back and Richard was drawn back had some stuff going on and we started walking together and Christine started uh stepping up a little bit with this and stepping up with that and Richard became a prayer uh person you know would pray for anybody anytime any place and uh and you know so then she started recording our services and on and on and, on. and then uh, our church shut down and here we are uh at this place and I think about the goodness of God. Your goodness keeps running after me. You know, and so I don't know why I started telling that story. It was just came to me. It's a good story. It's a good story, and I'm a storyteller. A lot of my 
a lot of my, uh, you know, Christina Richard will attest to this too, but a lot of my preaching, and I've been doing it for a lot of years, is stories. And I will tell you this ahead of time, and with, unapologetically, I used to apologize for it all the time. I rabbit trail all the time. And it's because uh, this is not a braggery or anything like that. It used to be a, like I felt a curse on me. Uh, my mind goes all over the place. Like you'll say something about the Lord or about what he's doing. And my mind will go, yeah, and this. And then it'll start getting there. And I'll go on to something else. I'll go on to something else. Fortunately, God has gifted me to pull it back together and get back to the point. So, uh Tonight, I have kind of a, maybe, I don't maybe not for you, but for me it's a little bit, not for me it's not different, but for you it might be different. I believe in the Bible from cover to cover. Again, I'm going to tell a lot of stories about myself, but it's not because I think I'm the example, but I know the stories I'm telling about me are true. And I don't know sometimes of the stories some other people tell are true. And I'm a little bit of a skeptic. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm a little bit of a skeptic. I, I believe when the Bible says test every spirit and uh, let there be a witness, two or three witnesses about every, you know, someone says something. I'm about that. I used to teach my people. Uh, if someone comes up to you and says they have a prophecy for you, and you do it, listen, again, I'll make this disclaimer. You do whatever you want with what I'm saying. I'm not... If you disagree with me, it's okay. And if you have something to help you know, instruct me, I'm that person. I'm hungry for, for insight. And you'll kind of get that tonight as I talk with you about what... Uh, so I probably, when I say I've probably read the Bible 20 times, maybe I've read it 40 times from cover to cover because I love the Word of God. Uh, but I sometimes think that the church and the people of God have missed a huge part of God. And I think it has alienated people inside. This is going to look, be a little confusing, but I think to some extent it has alienated some people in the church. They still come, they're still part of it, but they feel like they might be a little bit outside because there's some people that know the scripture Backwards and forwards, they know how to portray the things of God. And sometimes it sets up this mindset of he or she has it figured out in the kingdom of God. They know the scripture, they know the right theology, they know the end times uh, theology, how it's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not one of those guys. I've you know, I've studied a ton. I've been to a lot of colleges, done a lot of studying. And the reason I, I've studied, and this really sounds funny, I want to dialogue with people about the teachings of God. Because I grew up being taught, this is what the Bible says, this is what we do, this is why we do it, and... I also came from a Dutch background and went to a Dutch church. And so if you know anything about the Dutch, uh, if you know me at all, maybe you do know something about the Dutch, but they're like, this fits for us. This works for us. And they came from, for those of you that are theologically uh, more astute or more educated in that area, they were five-point Calvinist. On a Calvinistic thing, I'll teach you about that some other time if you want. It doesn't matter to me, honestly. Whether you are or not, and if some of my old Christian Reformed people heard that, they'd say, see, Danny's the offshoot or the, the offshoot of what we were supposed to be. Although they're not that way so much anymore. But I had questions, and I wanted to talk about things. And so when I say I read the Bible, I wanted to discuss it. And I'm going to share with you one snippet. And again, I shouldn't, I get criticized for making apologies. Just say it. Quit saying it's okay if you don't believe it. Because you're going to leave here and you're going to say there's truth to it or not. And whether I say you have to believe it or not it makes no difference because you're going to make up your mind. So it's not, uh, it's not heresy. I'm going to guarantee you that right now. 
and it's biblical. In fact, we're going to use the Bible over and over and over. But I think I'm going to help you point out, I'm going to point out to you something that's been not a sore point with me, but at least a point that I think uh, has maybe eliminated a lot of people that have giftings in the, in the body of Christ, and, it's, and we've tried to keep them within, not on purpose, not on purpose, but keep them, know your Bible from cover to cover, know how to pray, spend enough time in prayer. I'm going to give you another example. My wife, uh, when we had our church, we had 24-hour prayer meetings, okay? And we'd pray on, once a month from uh, 7 o'clock at night, Saturday or Friday night, to 7 o'clock Saturday. And my wife couldn't wait for it, okay? And... I couldn't wait for it, but for another reason. Because I was supposed to love it. As a pastor, that should be up my alley. 24 hours of prayer, 24 hours alone with God and people that love the Lord. And yet after about a half hour, I was like, I got 23 and a half more hours of this. And my wife was into it. And the guy that helped me plant the church, Art Thomas, and those people were into it. I just, we'd start praying someone would have a prophecy, and I'd want to say, okay, well, okay, that's good. How does that apply to the rest of the world that doesn't know Jesus Christ? That doesn't care about them. They're not, they're not, the spawn of Satan. Because I'm going to tell you another thing. I believe everybody is created in the image of God. And I believe everybody carries the image of God in them. No matter how rotten they appear to us, I believe they carry the image of God. They're made in His image, but they're not walking according to that. So, I, I've given enough precursor to it. By the way, because I said to you I like discussion, if we used to do this in my church too, by the way. I tell them, I'm going to preach today. I'm going to preach from the Word of God. But if somewhere in the middle of it, you're not getting what I'm talking about, or it's not making sense to you, or you have something that, you know, like, what about this? Like, you've always wondered, why can't I ask somebody? Go ahead. It was disruptive. I remember it was Sanctity of Life Sunday. Anybody know what Sanctity of Life Sunday is? Okay. Love Sanctity of Life Sunday. Love it. But for me, Sanctity of Life Sunday was not just about the unborn. It was about the people with mental disturbances. The people that were never going to be able to function, and I don't function at a terribly high level, but going to function like I do. Which at times I've questioned, you know. Sanctity of Life was about that too. So I was preaching on Sanctity of Life one Sunday, and in the process I talked about the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, and that we need to forgive everybody. And we used to have to have a person in our church that uh, watched a lot of supernatural stuff and had a lot of questions and was troubled. I mean, a lot of people are troubled, and some people know how to hide it, and others don't. In fact, one of my kids said the other day, you know, I really don't like people all that much, but I've learned to, you know, put on a good facade when I'm around people so they don't know just how crabby I am. You know, I don't know if you've ever been that way. Like, I guess i got to be nice. I don't really want to be nice. I don't really like people right now. But anyway, so I'm preaching away, and all of a sudden she, she just goes, hold up, Pastor Dan, crying, weeping bitterly. And she says, are you telling me I have to forgive the guy that raped me as a little girl over and over who was my relative? Now, I didn't like that question. But that's the kind of stuff that to me, to me, was real down in the dirt reality about how does Christianity look at this? You, I don't like this is what you should do. This is what you should do. One size fits all. And I think it has, I think to some extent it has 
cut off or curbed the abilities of many people within the body of Christ to use their giftings and even their questionings and their their abilities, and they wonder why, you know, I don't fit that. I don't know how to reach someone. I'm going to tell you something right now, okay? I'm just going to say this to you. I know there are certain denominations that say we ought to all be soul winners, okay? Everybody ought to be a soul winner. I'm going to jump way ahead of my message here. I'm going to ask this question right now. Who here, no, I'm not going to ask. I'm going to ask you, don't raise your hand, because this really isn't fair. Uh, I'm going to do another precursor, rabbit trail. I used to have a friend of mine. He'd say to me, Pastor Dan, if I had your gift as an evangelist, you know, you have the gift. Had, I've had more people tell me, you have the gift of evangelist, Dan. And I said, what does that mean? Well, you, you can get up and preach, or you can get up and you can talk to people about Jesus. You have the gift of an evangelist. And again... Because I've read the Bible enough times and wrestled with it. I wrestle with the Bible more than I just buy it hook, line, and sinker. I'm just going to be square with you. I wrestle with it. And this is the beauty of my relation with Christ. I'll even tell you about my fasting. When I fast, I fast for a reason. Never, ever have I gotten an answer from God in the middle of my fast. Never. Well, you, you must not be fasting right. You might No. But I can tell you this, every time I've gone to God with something and really pounded my heart out to Him, eventually, and usually in kind of a shocking manner, He gives me a response. And many times it's from people that aren't believers. I'll be asking God about something, what about this, what about that? And I'll be walking along talking to somebody and they'll go, hey, did you know about all... And I'll go, whoa, and they'll go, What? And I'll say, Do you, I'm just, can I tell you something? I'm just going to tell you something. Can I? And we're already walking along. They go, yeah, sure, tell me. Three weeks ago, on such and such a day, I was praying and asking God for some help on this. And you just gave me the answer. And then I'll ask him, have you ever been used of God before? And they'll go, what? And usually not with just nice words. It's usually, what the, are you talking about? And I'll say, oh, then the doors open and I just simply tell them, this is what I did. Because it is what I did. And they can argue with your theology. They can argue, but they can't argue your testimony. It's your testimony. And if we are walking that way, there's real power in it. So let me ask you this question. Uh, oh, on the way here, actually I opened up my book that I was writing my little notes in. And uh, I read this. This was, I don't know when it was from. And it doesn't have anything to do with our message tonight, but I'm just going to read it to you a minute because I think it might be for someone. All right? Kindness leads to repentance. I don't know why I wrote that in there. That's in the Bible. God's kindness leads to repentance. Okay? I, I, I don't know why I wrote this, so I'm going to just say it to you and you do with it what you want. Value supersedes performance. Value stays consistent, not subject to performance. And I, I, I'm just not going to expand on that. But in the la I'm just going to say this much. In the last year, even though I've been preaching the gospel for a lot of years, in the last year, I've come to recognize that Jesus, <laughs> this is going to sound so, like I know that. Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. And, gosh, I want to tell you another thing that happened to me recently, but I will tell you this. This is what makes it real to me. I, I think a lot. I told you that already. And I also, like I've had a lot of people in my life with mental illness or with addictions or with other things. So I've had them. I've had, you know, addictions. <laughs> Probably meant, I'm not laughing if you have mental illness, but I'm just saying I probably have mental illness too. Places, and so I studied it, and you know, the, this is facts. Anybody will tell you this, Christian or not, that you build channels. There are channels in your brain, physical channels, that chemicals go down, and they travel that way. And 
some people can't help it, so that's why they program them or disciple them or discipline them so that those channels start eventually growing back in and other physical channels begin growing in your brain so that your chemicals will go that way instead of that way. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, so let's say, let's say, you, let's say you're predisposed to... Uh, I'm just going to use anger because I've never seen it in you. Okay, well then maybe the Lord's speaking to you. But anyway, <laughs> uh, let's say anger is the easiest way for you to go when you handle something. And I relate to this, by the way. I'm, I'm very intense and I've, I've had people tell me all my life, you're so intense. And I'll go, no, even my wife, we got married. She goes, don't you yell at me. And I'd say, I'm not yelling at you. I'm just excited. This is how I talk when I'm excited. And the truth is, if you would have sat at our dinner table, my mother and I went at it. You know, we'd argue. She'd go, Danny, you can't live the way. i go, why can't I? That's how I'm made. This is what I do. And, you know, we'd argue, and then we'd get done. And this was another channel. We'd get done. I'd walk over to her. I'd put my arm around her and say, Mom, I love you. I didn't care who was around. I didn't matter who was around. I'd say, Mom, I love you. I'd give her a big kiss. And next supper, boom, we'd be going at it. Anyway, so that was a channel. That's, that was the way I did things. So you actually physically get, this is the way I do things. This is the way I do things. This is the way I do things. Then I met my wife. She said, this is not the way we do things. You know? And the truth is this, when you really love somebody, when you really, really love somebody, and it's this way with the Lord too, it's not, please don't get, and if, even if you don't like this, I'd say I don't care, but that's kind of hard. If you really love the Lord, sometimes you say, Lord, I got such a bad temper. Take it away. I'm not that person. I believe in instantaneous healing. I believe that people get delivered from addiction. I believe that. But I'm tired of Christians praying for deliverance from stuff that they ought to be working on. And they ought to be re-channeling. And no matter how much it costs. And I'm tired of other Christians. I'm getting on my high horse here. I'm tired of other Christians going, why are they still that way? Where is this iron sharpened iron where, yeah, I got a temper. I got a bad temper. Would you mind helping me with it? And the problem is, usually, like I had this happen to me. I was in a big church. I had been on the mission field. And I came back, and there was this meek elder, big church, 3,000 people. Meek little elder. And I mean it. I, no, no offense to this. He had red hair. Little glasses like this, uh, very fragile, and uh, the dude was tender. I mean, he was sweet. He was kind. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. I could see it on him. And I said, I need that, man. I, I need that. I don't want the bald head. I'll keep my hair. I don't really want to go tiny. I want to still wrestle with my boys and that kind of stuff. That's who I'm made to be. Which, by the way, there are things you're made to be. That you're made to be. And it's not meant to be changed. And sometimes, that's a whole other series, but we're meant to, God likes you the way you are. But he wants to take how you are and turn it into something that gives honor and glory to his kingdom. And it's not always inside this church or any church. More than likely, it's out on the streets. And I'm going to get to that right now. Did I fin finish my little thing? Did I wrap Oh, the brain thing. So yes, you have to, you can reprogram your brain. And this is what happened. A buddy of mine called me. We've been reading the same book for a couple years now. Uh, the Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee. And I used to read it when I was in college, going through Bible college. And I'd read it and I'd go, oh Lord. Because I wanted to be such a good Christian. I wanted to be such a good Christian because I told the Lord when he rescued me, I said, Lord, if you will get a hold of me, 
I will serve you with everything within me. And I don't know if you hear what happened there. I will, Lord, I will do everything for you. I, I, I. And that's why I said to you a minute ago, this last year, when I found out Jesus paid it all, everything. I've been preaching the gospel for years and years and years, but this last year has been revelation to me. What I just read to you, uh, value supersedes performance. Anyway, buddy called me up. We've been deep in the things of God, changing left and right, him more than me. Anyway, uh, he goes, man, I just, I fell. I don't know what happened to me. He goes, I fell into an old pattern. I go, how many, how many times? The once. I, I went back. Can I just tell you what it was? He said, I looked on a Facebook page at a woman who was scantily clad. And you know I don't, and by the way, let's just be real about it. There's a book written about every man's battle. Okay? So let's quit playing that men don't look. They look. What they do with the look is what makes a difference. That's another story. Anyway, he goes, I fell, I looked on a Facebook page. And, and I'm a little bit of a sensitive person. Like, we've been back and forth. And he goes, and I'm talking to my pastor now. And he's helping me work through it. And I'm sitting there going, what are you telling me for then if we're not going to deal with this? We've been dealing with everything. Why don't you, you know, so I'm getting the chip on my shoulder. I'm just being square with you. That's one of my channels. People... I considered it, the, you know, uh, rejection, which, by the way, is another set of things I can tell you about it. Rejection is massive in keeping believers from completing what God has in store for them. Rejection is huge, and I believe it digs channels early and deep. And it can be dealt with if a person's willing to face it a couple times over and over and go, that's not who I am. And someone else walks them through it and goes, that's not who you are. Not, not, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's okay. God's going to take care of it. I don't like platitudes. I like, yeah, you're living with rejection right now. And guess what? Guess what? I understand it somewhat. And so when you start feeling rejected again, we're going to talk about it. We're going to walk through it. And I'm going to assure you, from what I know about you, not some platitude, I know you don't want to live in rejection. I know you uh, have been rejected, but that isn't your life right now. Can we take one small step and go, I'm accepted in Christ, and just walk that for today? And tomorrow, if it happens, we'll do it again. It takes time, and it's a process. I'm all about healing. I Listen. We traveled and saw healings. And again, I'm not trying to boast about this. We saw miraculous healings, miraculous healings. But I got out of the uh, evangelism field. We preached around southern New England. The Assemblies of God asked us to come and preach around there and do revival services. It was during Brownsville. I never went to Brownsville, but stuff was happening, man. I mean, it was crazy. 200 people would come up for prayer and I mean, people would get healed and blah, blah. I'm going, what? I can't believe this is happening during our ministry. Anyway, walking with people is important. Now, I get to this thing. Here we go. I'm going to read you something. We have 100 billion galaxies. Our galaxy has billions of planets. We have 7.8 billion species of creatures on the earth and contrary to what you might be hearing and you can look into this i could be wrong and you can prove me wrong yes animals are going extinct they are going extinct and greenpeace and whoever else who's telling us about save the whales i'm all about it i'm not with them because i don't agree with their philosophy but yeah let whales are dying and it's sad but babies are dying but anyway uh Contrary to what most people know, they are discovering new species faster than we're losing old species. And that's because our God remains what? Creative. Beyond compare. Beautiful. And guess what you are? You're the same thing. 
And God loves you the way you are and wants to use your ability in the arena you're in. And yes, we want to work hard in the church. Yes, we want to make this. But let me tell you what. I got a little news for you. Most of the unbelievers aren't coming in here. And I'm all, again, I, please, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. Lord, make us ready. Make us ready for the influx of unbelievers that are coming here. I want to go, make us ready to go out to the unbelievers. They don't have to sit in our pews. This is not the place God reveals himself in the only place. In fact, this is my going to be my main point tonight. i got to watch my watch, my clock. What time is it? 7.49. What time do we get done? Okay, I'll be done before that. <clears throat> Open your Bibles to Genesis 1. Huh? We're going to start right at the beginning. I mean, I got, I have 50 verses, and that's probably not a, even the beginning of what I would love to read with you tonight, but I'm not going to even read the 50. I will tell them to you. But here we go. I love Genesis 1, 1 through, I don't know. Let's just see four for right now. So, you maybe heard this before, but this shocked me. It still shocks me. First three words of the Bible, three, first four words of the Bible, what? In the beginning, God. Okay? That isn't enough for me, but it should be. In the beginning, God. And then what's the next thing? Created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and dark was out, darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay? Now, what's the first thing God does to reveal himself? What's the first thing he records in the Bible? Huh? He said. he said, but what's the first thing he does? What's the first action? He creates. What does he create? Does he create the Savior? Does he create the cross? Now, there's scripture in Galatians that says, before the foundations of the earth, Christ was slain. I'm not dissing that. I'm not I believe that. God had foreknowledge. But God also said what? What was the pride of his however many days it took for creation? Man. And what did, what did he tell man to do? Multiply the men like that, the women like it too, but not quite as much because they have to have the babies. What else did he say? Be fruitful and multiply and what? I got a question for you. I, I'm, this is a question. I want to give what I think the answer is, but I'm not going to. Why in the world did he tell Adam and Eve to take dominion over the earth? Now, I've looked up the word dominion. You can twist it, turn it, do whatever you want. But he said take dominion over the earth. What does dominion mean? Why do you have to take charge? Huh? Why is that? I didn't hear you. Yeah, dominate comes from it. Why does something have to be dominated? Because you're kind of a dominant guy. I love you, but you're a little bit dominant. Okay? No, no. I I mean, anytime I go somewhere, he's dogmatic. About, not even dogmatic in a bad way. Just like, this is how it is, and this is what we did. And Why do you have to dominate something? Why do you have to dominate something? Because you have to be able to control it. To Bingo! You need to. So, there's what I'm talking about. I think, not that everyone else doesn't, but I can't help it. When I read that scripture, I think, what has to have dominion? It's all been created perfect. I'm going to leave that with you. Okay. I just think it's weird that dominates used there. But anyway, uh, I'm going to leave that one with you. If you want to talk about it later, I have some ideas. Not saying the gospel, but maybe you too read your Bible that way. Yep, he had to name the things. Yep. 
Yep. Yep. No, no, that's great. I'm glad you are. I'm glad you're thinking, because I know you're a student of the Word, too. You think it through, you dig in. Good. Anyway, just, you can think about that scripture. You don't have to buy what everybody's told you about it. You can ask questions. That's what I did. Why is there domination in there? Then, I don't want to tell you the rest of it, because I'm going to just teach you what I'm going to teach you here tonight. But i got lots of things on this that I think about. So, uh, the first thing we learn about God, and I don't know, I could be wrong, what does he want man to see? Everything he what? Everything he gave them. What else? Everything he what? Everything he made for them. Now I want to ask you this. Who of you have spent more time in your Christian life, by the way, this is a theological term. There's special revelation and there's natural revelation. Special revelation is the word of God, written by written over 1500 years by 40 some authors, red stream of the blood of Christ through the whole thing. Believe it all. I believe it all. What I wonder about is God's first act is creation. How many of you have taken time to study creation like you've studied the Bible? Or how many of you have been told, study creation, get to know God through creation, take time to read and study creation and understand why, by the way, why do leaves turn color in the fall? Good. Why do they turn red? or yellow, or green, or number of colors. But is there a chemical reason it happens too? Yeah, there's a chemical reason. Who created that chemical reason? Huh? God did. And guess what? I'm just saying this to you. I'm trying to challenge you. I'm just going to say this too. People don't give a rip about the Bible. Non-believers don't care about the Bible. I'm sorry they don't. But when you keep telling them the Bible over and over, there's no relationship. And I happen to think God's into relationship. And so I'm going to read you a little something out of one of those deep, deep books that I've read over the years. Deep books. I know you are, because you know me a little bit. So, I'm going to read this to you a minute. And I, me, I'm a little weird. I know I am. I got all lit up about this, and there's a reason I did. I'm going to read something to you here a minute. Some of you might recognize. Anybody recognize this page? Okay, good. I'm going to read this to you. Hi, Vanessa. Nice to see you. It feels good to hear those words when I see people I know, but I take it for granted that I have even heard that greeting, and in fact, all other sounds. I never think about how I'm hearing things, how my brain is translating sounds into meaning. Let me read this to you. Yet the process is fascinating. I might even cry when I'm reading this, because when I read it, I'm like, oh my God, I know who did this. I know who did this. I'm going to finish it. The journey of the sound from outside the ear and into the brain, which takes only milliseconds. What's a millisecond? What does that translate to? A thousandth of a second? Yeah, because mil in Latin is thousand. So I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't. I wanted you to be able to show your... I only know it's mil because I know Spanish, which is another thing I'm going to tell you. I studied Spanish to relate to people. Not be... Yeah, I had reason. I had reason. I loved my wife. I happen to love mankind. I do. So when I read this, I'm like, Lord, I'm going to read this. I'm going to learn something about you. And I'm going to tuck it. I, this is how, I, I'm going to tuck it in my wallet. And one of these days, someone's going to say something. And I'm going to say, hey, can I read you something a minute? And then they're going to say, why in the heck? Would you read that? And then I'm going to say to him, because, dude, 
and I used to be tough. I'm never going to cry about anything. I can't hardly talk about the Lord with people. And they go, what are you crying about? I go, because he changed me. And it's usually never me telling them, you got to get your act together or you're going to hell. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. There are people that have that gifting. But most of us, I mean, never mind. Let me finish. This is cool. Uh, which takes only milliseconds, is mind-bendingly elaborate. First, the sound waves enter each ear and vibrate. The paper-thin eardrum, they vibrate the paper-thin eardrum. That vibration moves to two small bones that sit behind it, which begin to dance in sync with the vibrations. So there's two eardrum, then there's two bones. I got dehiscence. I got a hole in my skull in this ear. So when the sound comes in here, it has an escape up into my brain cavity, which may not be as full as it should be, so things vibrate in there. So when I'm in a room with people and everybody's talking, i got to see your mouth moving. Or I get confused. What, what are they saying? Anyway, it's because, but I still hear, but it's just weird. So this is maybe this why it's important to me anyway. This vibration moves to two small bones that sit behind it, which begin to dance and sync with the vibrations. Then a third bone sitting against the cochlea starts to vibrate, and things get really interesting. The cochlea is a pea-sized bony structure shaped like a snail shell and filled with fluid. It's lined with tens of thousands of hair cells topped with bundles of miniature tubes called stereocilia. That, that vibrating third bone beats against the cochlea, like knocking on a door. The cochlea's fluid sways, and the hair cells wave like sea anemones. That movement causes the hair cells to release chemical neurotransmitters, triggering, triggering, triggering a series of electrical messages that are carried through the auditory nerves into the auditory cortex of the brain, which translates the electrical code into meaning. The delicate stereocilia and the hair cells have a limited lifespan. We start, start to lose our hearing because as they're used again and again through a lifetime exposure to a sound at regular volume or shorter term exposure to loud sounds, they can become damaged and stop doing their job called presbycesis, the age-related hearing loss in most common type. Now, when I read something like that, I'm a preacher. I don't get to do it much anymore, but I think about it, and I go, that's like Christians. They hear the gospel so much that pretty soon they get excited about it for a minute. I heard it, and then they leave, and they go wherever, and there's nothing happening. But when you're getting fresh revelation from the Lord, there is nowhere where you can't be excited. I'm all about praise songs. I'm all about it. But we sang today that every, what was it? every breath I have, may I use every breath I have, something, to worship you. Something like that. I can't remember it. When I'm singing songs, I love the songs. And then I'm thinking, every breath. And then I'm thinking, I spent two minutes just reading that. And am I going to do anything? I count this as a revelation from God. I'm just telling you. I count this as a revelation from God. That's why I get excited about it. Because he did it. And I know that there's people out there that understand this or want to kind of know about it. And I'm just waiting. I can't wait. If God's showing me something, I happen to believe it's not for me. And it's not just the Bible. I love the, I told you this, i got to keep saying it to you. I love this Bible. But I'm going to tell you what, nature doesn't get its, its just due in the kingdom of God and the people of God. Sometimes I walk down the road going, my foot goes in front of it. And it goes in front of the other one. And it goes in front of the other one. Why in the world does it do that? Well, it's just natural. Yeah. It's natural revelation. I don't care if I can't remember scripture right then. I am walking with God because I'm recognizing God has made this. The trees, when they turn that color, I drive down the road. I don't give a rip who is with me. I go, can you believe those colors? And then I ask them, do you know why that tree's red? 
You know why that one's orange. That's why I asked you. Because I've read about it and I forget. And most of the time I ask people because I want to see if they know. And if they do know, I'm like, yes. New stuff about my God that I'm going to be able to share with somebody somewhere. And I, people are a little more interested. Folks, I'm trying to tell you this book is full of how creation sings God's praise. I think there's a reason creation is the first thing in here. Because I think people forget. God sent Jesus. God gave the special revelation. But how about natural revelation? Why are we not given more attention and honor and glory to God for giving us nature? I mean, it's half of his revelation. This is his special revelation. Love it. This is his natural revelation. I read something the other day. Now let's, let's go to another scripture. All right, because you got to believe me. When I tell you I love the Bible, I should use it. Uh, Job 12, 7 through 12. There's another book. Oh, my goodness. You know, uh, Ecclesiastes says, the study of many books can lead to, you know, trouble. So, I've read a lot of books on Job. and Job 12, 7 through 12. I'll read it unless you want to, sweetie. No, no, I'm cool. All right. But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you. And the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these things does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In, though, in whose hand is the life of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? Does not the ear test words, and the mouth taste its food? Wisdom is for the age of men, and with length of days understanding. I feel like I'm in that stage. I'll give you another example. I was teaching a men's Bible study a while back, about 50 men. And I had just read a book called Braiding Sweetgrass. Has anybody here ever read it? Okay. Now, again, you might feel the same way as the guy that was listening to me. But Braiding Sweetgrass is by a Native American, uh, First American, whatever you call him. And uh, so I was saying, you know, she was writing this book and she makes it very clear. I'm decidedly un unchristian. I don't believe Christians because they don't take care of earth. They kill the earth with herbicides. They wipe everything out. They grow big corn things with uh, Roundup Ready uh, stuff, which kills all the bugs in the ground. And the bugs are meant to be there to kill other bugs so that food will grow naturally. And we got this big, huge thing, GM, no GMO, blah, blah, blah. And yet, you and I eat GMO food every day, whether we think we do or not, even non-GMO as this GMO. Anyway, so she writes this book. I'm reading it. And I'm flipping out learning things about God. How we, I don't even know what the three sisters are in agriculture. Good for you, Pammy. And why are they the three sisters? Did you hear? Corn, beans, and squash. And why are they called the three sisters, Pam? Do you know? I'm not, I, because I'd rather have you tell it. Because I didn't know until I read the book. Just being honest. And you don't have to. I think it has something to do with the way they grow in harmony. That's exactly what it is. Corn's tall. It needs something to cover the ground to keep it cool so, she, so it can grow. So beans spread out. Let's see. Corn, squash. Oh, yeah. Squash spreads out and puts its tentacles in the ground and covers the ground so that moisture stays there so corn can grow. Beans put nitrogen. How many of you know that when they grow corn? Have you ever seen them go out there when they grow corn and they got these huge machines and they're spraying white stuff? Yeah. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. It's what? Yeah, yeah it's not, it's, it's uh, whatever beans produce, but it's man-made. Okay? Nitrogen. nitrogen, exactly. Fill the ground with man-made nitrogen. But this lays right in the book about how Earth was made to take care of itself, but man abuses it, okay? I, I'm the first guy, like, I, I quit letting them farm my property. Was it rebellion? 
No. I just got sick of stuff being on it. And sorry if you don't like this, but I shoot deer there. And I prefer they're not eating Roundup Ready corn. Because you can act like venison is great for you, but if it's living in bean fields that are Roundup Ready, yeah, I got some news for you. It's non, it is GMO, and genetically modified organism. Anyway, I'm reading the book. I preach a sermon on how God is in everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The people and they that dwell therein. Uh, has God not created the earth for mankind? Blah, blah, blah. I'm not quoting scripture. One and then I go, and so I'm reading this book uh, from the Native Americans. And uh, this came up. And one of the guys in there, long-term Christian, love him, still love him. He goes, you're kidding me, Pastor Dan. I go, no, I, they are three sisters. They help. No, just that's not what I'm talking about. You're not reading that pagan book, are you? I went, I'm not reading it anymore. I read it all. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little cocky. I don't know. He goes, and I said, and they have a different idea of how creation happened. They, I don't know if you know that, but a turtle, back of a turtle and the whole thing with the Native Americans. Because that's what they know. Okay? I, that doesn't offend me. That doesn't bother me. Because I happen to know they know some stuff that I don't know. So I want to get in a relationship. In fact, I wrote this lady a letter. And I said, I know you're anti-Christian. I'm a pastor. But I just want you to know I loved your book. And even though you didn't know it, I learned a ton about the God who is the God of Christianity through what you wrote. Love to talk with you sometime. And I didn't hear from her. And that's okay. I don't blame her. She's probably had enough. But anyway, so the guy... He says, that's pagan, their religion is pagan, it's demonic, and blah, blah, blah. I told you how I feel about all people. I think every person is made in the image of God, and that everybody can represent God, whether they know him personally or not yet. And so he walked out along with another guy furious at me. I'm sorry. Sometimes when you step outside the boundaries of what is formally taught, because you think outside that, and you should. Paul, who did Paul uh, laud that came to hear him preach? Anybody know? He called him, you noble, starts with a B. There's Baptist church named this all over the place. Bereans! And why did he call him noble? Do you know Noah? I'm sorry. I, I'm just calling him because... I, I just want this stuff to come up in your mind for practicality reasons. He called them noble because when Paul preached, they didn't go off to try to prove him wrong. They went off to prove him right, to see if his facts were... And our pastor does that too. You don't have to believe me. Check me out. And I do. Because there's times I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, hold up a minute. Not wrong, but what about this side of it? Or what about that side of it? And I respect our pastor greatly. In fact, it's the reason I'm here. Because I think he's one of the most integral men that I've met in the ministry. Long before I heard him preach, I came to a meeting here, a couple meetings here, and he was out, out there in a sweatshirt, in jeans, cleaning the floor, serving all the men. It was a men's uh, conference or something. And the truth is, I thought, oh, he must be the janitor because he's doing all the janitorial stuff. And then I found out he was the pastor and he wasn't doing any of the introductions or anything, and I was ticked. Sorry, I almost said the <laughs> naughty word. You all say it, so don't get so excited. You don't. I know you don't. You're pure and holy. I know, and I shouldn't... Oh, I remember when it was really bad to say that. It is really bad to say it. You know what? Again, my mother would slap my face if I said fart. I'm just saying, fart is a four-letter word. Don't you ever say that. And God forbid the S-H-I-T word. And I always told my kid, don't say that word. That comes out of one pore and not the other. You get my point. It stopped him for a while. Anyway, uh, did you hear what it said there in Job? Go ask the fish. Go ask the snakes. Go ask the water. Go ask them what? And what are they going to tell you? Remember? I know because I went all over the place. You probably already forgot. I did too. What are they going to tell you? 
Who created them? How he sustains them? Folks, please hear me out. I know I keep repeating. I'm not anti this. I'm this and this, and I'm afraid this end has not gotten justified parts. I feel bad for God. Is that fair? I feel bad for him. You gave me all this, and all I do is read that? Not, no, Doug, you came the wrong time, buddy. <laughs> all I teach from is this? When you gave me all this, what is wrong? I'm not going to say it's demonic, but I am going to say this to you. What the devil can't prevent, he perverts. And if he can keep you just looking at this and ignoring all that, like, oh, it's a fallen creation. They're, everybody's going to hell. They're, America's going down the tubes. I'm just going to take all my time to beef about America and how terrible we are. And nobody's serving God. Hey, I got a challenge for you. Take half that time you do beefing and reading about all the terrible things about But I had a pastor, a good friend. In fact, he's my cousin. Popular preacher, probably one of the three best preachers I've ever heard in my life. Incredible preacher. Could come, could take this and that and this and that and bring it. And you're just sitting there going, oh my gosh, that, that was that's not a good word either. Uh, oh my good, that's not a good word either. Oh my. And you'd go, wow, that was great. And then when uh I think it was when Clinton came into office. How long ago was that? How long? Anybody know? Okay, so I was doing uh, Fallerville Freedom Center at that time. And every day I would get a meme showing how stupid Clinton was. I don't know it was a meme, but some joke about him. Or I think if it was Biden's time. He'd be sending me something, how stupid Biden is, how many times he falls over, blah, blah, blah. I got 30 or 40 of them. Finally, I wrote him and I said, when are you and me going to get together and pray for those who are in authority over us? Because I don't want another one of these. I already know he's stupid or he's old or he falls over. And if he doesn't get saved, he's going to fall over and never get up. Help, I've fallen down and I can't get up. You know, that would probably be a good enough one for me. Folks, we have this word, but it's time for us to go back to square one and go, God was creative. He keeps us creative. He's still creating. You are walking in miracle power every time you let this air come in and go out, comes in this way, goes out that way. Then it goes off to the trees. They do something with it, and then the trees give off oxygen, and when the trees go away, people get sick, and blah, blah, blah. And our God set that up. And I'm not here to talk about, take care of the trees, hug the trees. That's not my point. I'm saying, you could be taking, there's a, almost everything we beef about in society, we could be finding God in the middle of it. In fact, that was my, is that my last point? What time is it? Pretty close. Uh... Uh, what was I saying? Trees. 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 Forget it. Let me go on. Forget it. Just forget it. I didn't have anything for you there. Uh, let's look up Psalm 19, my favorite. The heavens. Anybody know this one? The glory of God. What else does? Does anybody know what the firmament is? Good for you! You, you knew that too? Yeah. That's my mom. <laughs> I know that. Does she teach you that? That's my mom. What do you think? She knows it. I know it. That'd be great. If moms that were smart taught their kids more than just behave. Like I got a daughter-in-law. Golly. My little Sammy. Sammy wasn't a believer when she started dating my son. I'm just going to tell you this. I met her eight years uh, before those two ever hooked up, went out to a deer camp. I'm not going to say anything bad about the family, but decidedly different lifestyle at deer camp than we had. Okay? I went out there. She's at this deer camp. 
Huh? No, a deer camp is like they have a trailer on the ground that they all hunt. The whole family. So deer camp is, we come there on November 15th, which is opening day of gun hunting. So if anybody's a prayer person, standing in the need. Anyway. The camp is just where they all meet to all go hunting out from there. Hey, we're going to hang out here tonight. We're going to sleep. But before we sleep, we're going to have fun together. Blah, blah, blah. I went out there met this girl. No relationship to my son or our family. I walked out and I said to my son, that's a nice girl. He goes, what? I said, well, that's a nice girl. He goes, dad, she's got a boyfriend. She's been going straight with my son. That's fine. She can still be a nice girl. You know, nine years later, he calls me up and goes, hey, Dad, you know, what do you think of Sam? I said, I told you what I thought of her nine years ago, and I still feel that way. She's not a believer, but she has started coming to our church. And at our church, I'd be preaching, and she'd go, she called me Popster right from the beginning. Popster, what about this? She'd sit right in the front. That's like meat to a pit bull. Yeah. I'm going, somebody's listening. This is awesome. She go, Popster, what about this? What about that? She happened to be a evolutionist, big time. Had a sister who was the, what do you call it, smartest person at graduation? Was a valedictorian, brilliant. Both believed in evolution. Thought creation has no value. So for some of us, maybe that would be a big problem. So I invited my friend. A really stout, strong guy from Creation uh, Creation Research Institute with Ken Ham. Okay, he was one like his right hand man. I said, "Hey, would you come out to my church?" This is a little devious, but I don't care. The Bible says the people of this world are wiser than the Christians, and they use the things of this world to. So, I said, "Come on out and teach, man." And I said, "But I just want you to know, I wasn't completely dishonest. I wasn't dishonest at all. I said, I'm going to invite people." that don't believe like you do. You know, that's, again, meat to a pit bull, because if you're a creation research guru, it's like you can't wait to tell people how right you are about how creation is. I'm just being honest. And that's not, I'm saying they're wrong. Just saying they're as gung-ho as I can. I remember when uh, Ken Ham debated uh, Phil Ni or Bill Nye, the science guy. I was thoroughly disappointed. But anyway, not in... Bill Nye, the science guy, because I knew he was an uncle. Right. Anyway, Sammy's asking questions. So I started this, had this thing on Wednesday nights. He taught, and I invited every evolutionist I knew, because I had a relationship with him. And he'd start talking, and they'd say, well, hold on here a minute. What about such and such? And he'd go, well, such and such and such. And I go, I go, wow, this is really good dialogue. By the way, the one girl that was the valedictorian, unbeliever, avid uh, evolutionist, <clears throat> she ends up starting to go to church. Went to our church for a while. We weren't really hip enough, not really smart enough probably for her. She was brilliant. So she went to 242. Pretty soon she calls and goes, Popster, I gave my life to Jesus. I'm getting baptized. I'm crying, man. I'm going, thank you, Father. Meanwhile, I got a buddy going, at 242, they're not spirit-filled. They're not speaking in tongues. And I'm going, who cares? I don't care. My friend just got saved and is getting baptized. And you're going to be because they're not speaking in tongues? Stop it. Right now. I believe in tongues, by the way. Again, I believe in this. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I might have a little different view on what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is than some people. That's okay. Uh, she gets saved. She calls me up. Popster, marrying a state trooper. Blatant unbeliever. Blatant unbeliever. Will you come and do premarital counseling for us? Yeah, I'm going to come and do premarital counseling, but I'm just going to tell you, so and so and so and so, the girl and, and her husband, I'm going to tell you what the foundation is for me and why God matters. And here's what I usually tell them. I'll shorten it right up. Here you are. Here you are. You two are getting along great right now. 
but you're going to bang heads somewhere. And both of you are stubborn. You're both really stubborn. You're going to need someone that's way smarter, way wiser, what knows way more about history, the future, the past, and the present. That's God. I'm going to suggest to you that you make him the head of the triangle in your marriage. It's not just you two. you got a creator that gave you to each other, and you need to get a hold of him. I'd love to tell you he gave his life to Christ and on fire. He's not. But all my boys still hang with him, and they have no problem. They don't preach to him, but they tell him, yeah. They go to church. They invite him to church. Every time there's a baptism, he comes. He goes to church with his wife. I don't know what's going to happen. I just know this. When you reach people where they're at, and again, tons of them are not going to listen to this. But they're walking in the same creation you are, seeing the same trees, sucking the same air, having the same God-given blood flowing through their veins, having the same hair molecules and hairs in their ears and eardrums or lack of or whatever else. You know, you might meet someone that has the essence. I can't wait. I can't wait to meet them. So I was like, oh, I get it. And did you know that the first thing that happens, it enters here, and then it hits the little eardrum, then it hits the timbre, and then it hits this and that. I don't have that, neither do you, but you do have blah, 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 blah. I'm going to pull that little article out, and I'm going to go, they're going to go, dude, why do you have that in your wallet? And I'm just going to tell them. Because I read it in Reader's Digest, which is, by the way, where I got it. I love Reader's Digest. They're gone way liberal. I care. I care. But I'm going to keep reading it because there's articles in there. And I'm, I, I'm not bragging. I'm mature enough. I'm mature enough. I can handle it. I know Christ. I know that he's my deliverer. I know he's my high tower. I know he's the one that saves me, keeps me. And he won't let me fall. Unless I decide to go down that chemical trail I told you about that I used to go down. Oh, that's what I was going to I'll finish with this. I told my buddy that said he missed the boat and fell off the wagon. I said, okay, call him your past this great. I'll just pray for you. Drive another road. Got over my hurt feelings because I said, I'm at the cross. Christ took my hurt feelings. I, this is how I'm living now. Not perfectly because you're still going to see me angry. I don't have a honk if you love Jesus on my bumper for that very reason because I'm not yet at that point. I'd rather put on there, you know, I don't know what I put on there, but that, I'm not putting honk if you love Jesus because I do. Because there's times I'm driving that probably not the God. Anyway, I'm praying for him. I'm over the hurt. I'm thinking he doesn't have to call me for any advice, but I'm going to pray for him anyway. He's my good buddy. And all of a sudden, the Lord showed me this. And this is how simple I am, that the Lord can show me this, and I get jazzed about it. Because I already know the chemical things. I've studied it. I know how they work. Not completely, but I do know they're there and that they're real and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden the Lord said, yep, Jim got saved, and he's following me, and he's doing applying the cross every day when the things hurt. And God put a, de put a stop sign over those chemical trails, and they're getting healed. But sometimes, this is what the Lord said to me, sometimes the tire of a perfectly good vehicle gets caught in a rut, and it goes right through a stop sign. Or goes right into a place. I mean, I never want, wanted to go in a ditch. I loved four-wheeling. But I never liked it when my tire got hooked and I went down in a ditch. And I, and the Lord said, that's what happened to him. But guess what? He's driving a new vehicle now. And that vehicle can get out of any uh, detour or any stop sign that it's been detoured wrong. As fast as he went in it, he can get out because I'm his Savior and I gave him a new vehicle to live in. And it's run by me, empowered by me carried by me, and there's nothing that can keep him from my love or keep him from pulling right back up. I thought, well, that's for me too, then I'm just going to live with it. He called me up two minutes later. Well, what do you think? I said, glad you asked. Told him. He went, holy cow, man. And guess who got the glory for it? God did. And I certainly couldn't because it's a wacky little vision. You know, it's like, yeah, Vanderbilt, he's off in some land again. No, God gave it to me. That's who I am. That was one of the greatest revelations the Lord ever gave me. I gave you an imagination. Quit making apologies for it. I'm going to sanctify your imagination. And when you have divergent thoughts, give them to me, and I'm going to make something good out of them. I think all the I don't sleep well. 
I still don't know why I have this. I have nightmares three nights a week. Terrible nightmares. Horrible nightmares. I've asked people, do you, do you know why people have nightmares? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm going to keep talking to the Lord about it. And guess what? I believe the Lord's going to show me that it's okay that you do, or I'm going to stop them. Either way, it's okay with me because I'm his. Let's pray. In fact, do we have time to play that song? Now, if it goes a little too long, guess who we're blaming? If you need to leave in the middle of this song, you feel free. But please, I'm begging you. Go home and ask the Lord, how can I get more interest in creation? God. And not only that, whatever you teach me, who will you open the door? Because it's exciting when you learn something and you go, okay, I'm going to use this for you, Lord. Open the door. And it may not be great guns and it may not be testimony material on Sunday. Who cares? You live 90% of your life out there. Use it all for the Lord and then come back here rejoicing because you can be used on the streets. Amen. And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath The planets form And if the stars were made to worship so light I can see your heart in it Every burning star signal fire grace And if creation sings your praises so
on my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. We well, you lost your life. So I can find it here and if you left the grave behind you So I, I can see your heart And everything you've done Every part designed in a work of art Called love and if you glad of you. 